But Watman's drinks license was renewed. So was his music license, after council tests proved the music did not reach nuisance level. Even when live bands were playing, the meters proved the noisiest sound outside the pub was the squeaking of the pub sign. Yet Watman's problems got worse. The, the pressure from the police was incredible. I mean, they were coming down um, one particular night. They come down, I think it's only f it was four times in an evening, and sat outside in the car park till everyone had gone. Now, if you run a public house, you can, it's very difficult to, to, to run it successfully if police are there all the time. And it was then that I began to think they're doing it for a reason, to stop customers coming. Convinced that police pressure was ruining business, Watman decided to quit. He closed the pub and put it on the market. But before he could find a buyer, the drinks license had to be renewed again. This time the police objected, not because of the noise, but in effect because of the silence. They claimed the shut-down pub was a temptation to burglars. At the last minute, seven police officers came to the court to give evidence, but as Watman's barrister had not been notified, they were not allowed to testify. Even so, the magistrates decided against him. They were out for half an hour and they came back and decided uh, that I didn't have a pub licence anymore. Even though, in a sense, no evidence... No evidence was given at all. No evidence was given against me as a person, whatever, you know. The magistrate's decision brought financial disaster on John Watman. He had to sell the carrier's arms for £30,000 less than he paid and was forced into bankruptcy. But now he felt he was assembling more and more pieces of a Masonic jigsaw. He had long been puzzled by the attitude of Inspector Ron Duncan, who had been in charge of the officers from Tame Police Station who had paid so many visits to the carriers. But Duncan was not only a police officer, as Watman now learned from a friend who was a former policeman. He himself was a Freemason, and he said to me, did I know that Inspector Duncan was also a Freemason from the St Mary's Lodge at Tame, where all the lodges meet in that area? Uh, and I said, no, I said, I knew nothing about the Masonic there. And he pointed out all the people that were involved uh, um, with what happened to me who were Freemasons. Watman made many complaints against Thames Valley Police, alleging harassment, but a 20-month inquiry found no evidence to justify taking any action against any officers. He's still convinced he was victimised, but the mere fact that most of the people he came up against were on the square proves not conspiracy, only coincidence. He's now back in his old job as an engineer. It's ironic that he's using Freemasonry's symbolic tools for a practical purpose, making walking aids for disabled children. Dissatisfied with the police investigation, Watman has taken his complaint to English Freemasonry's headquarters. We've looked at it, we find that there are two people who opposed the grant of license for his pub because they believed it was going to be noisy and disturb them, and those two people happened to be Freemasons. Nothing to do with the lodge at all. Can you understand why, though, that he, he should see a Masonic conspiracy when he discovers that many of the people who he perceives to be against him, ratepayers, leaders, councillors, policemen, are all Freemasons who all meet at the same Freemasons Hall? I can't understand it, because I know that Freemasonry isn't for that sort of thing. Some people might think you're sort of paranoid, you're imagining the whole thing. I think that's how they get away with it, that they, they like to interpret it that way. But uh, I don't think I'm paranoid. I've, I've stuck at it for five years now to try and prove in some way or another what can, or, or what can be misused within the Masonic organisation. Arthur Edmonds is a Freemason, but he also feels that his life has been ruined by the charitable brotherhood known as Freemasonry. He and his wife Joyce were running a travel firm called Cruise Drive Tours Limited in the 1970s when friends suggested that they should organise cruises for Masons and their families. You seriously declare that unbiased by the improper solicitation of friends against your own inclination and uninfluenced by mercenary or other unworthy motive, you freely and voluntarily offer yourself as a candidate for the privileges and mysteries of Freemasonry? I do. I do. At his initiation, every Mason swears not to use Freemasonry for personal profit. As a past Lodge Master, Arthur Edmonds was well aware of this, 
but the whole point of the cruises was that all profits would go to Masonic charity. It's unusual for Masons to raise money like this, but with the help of a Masonic colleague, he got clearance from Grand Lodge and advertised in the national press. The first cruise was a huge success, and a second was needed to meet demand, but Edmonds was steaming into troubled waters. I was summoned before the Grand Secretary. I thought, oh good, I'm going to be congratulated for raising, I think by then it was about £28,000 for charities. But the Grand Secretary at the time, James Stubbs, did not offer congratulations. According to Arthur Edmonds, the meeting, which took place here at Freemasons Hall, was anything but pleasant. Referring to letters of complaint from a few Masons, the Grand Secretary said he was opposed to Masonic cruises in general and advertising them in particular. I'm not having it, he said. No more. I said, no, no. Masonry teaches, teaches me to look after charities. And that's what I'm doing. Quite legally and with your permission. I said, you are conducting a star chamber with me and I won't have it. With that, I'll go out of his room. Grand Lodge then dropped a bombshell in the quarterly communication or newsletter which it sends to every English Mason. It stated, The board wishes to make it clear that recent advertisements and circulars about so-called Masonic cruises do not have its approval or sanction. The board strongly deprecates the association of Freemasonry with commercial ventures and does not consider that any statement that profits from such ventures will be devoted to Masonic charity affects this situation. For Arthur and Joyce Edmonds, this was catastrophic. They'd contracted to pay a quarter of a million pounds for ships for further Masonic charity cruises. But after the newsletter was read out in all lodges, bookings dried up and cancellations poured in. Edmonds was not just under attack from Grand Lodge. The very charities which had taken the money from his cruises were now denying they'd ever got any. All of a sudden, they were having cheques returned by the charities. They wouldn't accept them. One particular one, the Masonic Hospital, stated that they could not state whether any money had ever been received from Cruise Drive Tours Limited, or me. And yet before that I'd had masses of congratulatory letters and I had every receipt. Fifteen years earlier, Edmonds had been charged with deception and fraud in connection with another business. He says he was framed, but his barrister had strongly advised him to plead guilty and he was sentenced to three years in jail. The implication now that he had pocketed money destined for charity was like history repeating itself. I myself called in Scotland Yard Fraud Squad and made them check all the books. I asked the Department of Trade and Industry to check all the books with all the bank statements and all the checks. The Fraud Squad found nothing wrong and for years Edmonds tried to clear his Masonic reputation and get a fair hearing from Grand Lodge. Eventually, the new Grand Secretary, Michael Hyam, responded in a letter that he'd seen no evidence that any charity money raised by Edmonds had been misapplied. But this didn't solve Edmonds' problem. I couldn't contact all the Masons in England. So I asked him to produce that letter or a statement in the Grand Lodge quarterly communication, which itself had ruined me. Refused. Mr. Edmonds asked you to reproduce that letter in the quarterly communication to clear his name. Why did you refuse to do that? Because I didn't reckon that I was in the business of clearing his name. What we had done was to stop his cruises being described as Masonic with apparently Grand Lodge's approval. He asked me for a different assurance and I went as far as I thought I reasonably could and I did so in that letter. Edmonds had been ruined. As a result of Grand Lodge's actions, Cruise Drive Tours had gone bankrupt, and he and his wife were reduced to living on the dole. Surely they would not deliberately have destroyed your business and, and made you bankrupt. I think for power, they would have done anything. And the power being that they can wield over ordinary masons.